In this section of the course, we're going to be discussing some of the molecular features that allow the permeation and gating of the voltage-dependent ion channels. Today, we're going to discuss some of the major features of voltage-gate ion channels. We're going to discuss some of the molecular features that allow those channels to fast and slow inactivate upon voltage and finally we're going to discuss some of the structural domains involved in voltage sensing of this class of ion channels. Please bring two or more questions from this lecture to the class session. Let's start with the primary structure of ion channels. This term refers to the amino acid sequence that each ion channel has. So, for example, uh, in this figure, you can see several uh, potassium channels that has been aligned in terms of amino acid sequence similarity. And you can see that this sequence has those different amino acids, for example, threonine, alanine, tryptophan, and so on. And you can see that some of those amino acids is well conserved among those different types of ion channels. In particular, this area here of this ion channels, the sequence TVGYG, you can see is very conserved among potassium channels. We are going to discuss uh, uh, what's the functional significance of this area of the potassium channels in a later lecture. So, uh, what's important about the primary structure of these ion channels, or that means the amino acid sequence, is that allow us to predict some of the characteristics of these channels, allow us to make functional inferences about what parts of the ion channels might be involved, what kind of function this, this particular region of the ion channel has, and finally, we can use this uh, sequence of amino acids to predict uh, the different families and subfamilies of the ion channels, as we're going to see. In this figure, you can see an example of a potassium channel, a potassium channel named Shaker, uh, because it was cloned from Drosophila, so, so from fruit flies, and uh, this uh, uh, fruit flies, uh, upon exposure to ether, start to shake very violently and uh, uh, some investigators were able to clone the gene that was confirmed this, this phenotype to, this, to these fruit flies and they found out that the gene encoded a potassium channel, a potassium channel then named Shaker. As you can see, uh, uh, this sequence has 650 uh, and so amino acids and it has the amino terminals always here and then a C terminals or carboxyl terminals here. And then if you, if you look at the sequence of amino acids, you're going to find some amino acids that are very uh, polar or, or charged. So for example, you can see some lysines here. Uh, you can see some uh, arginines here and so on. And also you're going to see some hydrophobic amino acids such as uh, phenylalanine here, valine, valine, and so on. Now, when you, you find a cluster of amino acids that are very hydrophobic, uh, that might imply that this region of the ion channel spans the plasma membrane. Because, as you know, hydrophobic amino acids like to partition in, in a very hydrophobic environment, such as the plasma membrane. So this area of the, of, the, of the ion channel has a concentration of very hydrophobic amino acids, and there's another area of, of, of the ion channel that also has a very uh, cluster of amino acids that are very hydrophobic, and so on. Uh, so one of the predictions, uh, sometimes not true, but uh, a first prediction would be that these parts of the ion channel 
would span the plasma membrane. And, uh, and if you plot this, how hydrophobic or how, how hydrophilic those amino acids are, uh, you have those hydro, this kind of plots, hydro, hydropaticity plots. And uh, in, in this case, uh, amino acids are very hydrophobic, will be very positive in, in this y-axis. Hydrophobic. While amino acids are very hydrophilic, will be in this case negative. So you can see that the amino terminals here have a concentration of very hydrophilic amino acids and the C terminals will be also a concentration of very hydrophilic amino acids. While these parts of the ion channel would constitute what we call membrane spanning domains of these ion channels. Like we said before, uh, if we look at the sequence of amino acids of several ion channels, uh, you can find that uh, you can cluster in terms of amino acid similarity or homology in different subfamilies. Uh, and also within a, a, a particular subfamily, you can start to see individual members. So for example, here in this figure, you have uh, uh, some uh, homology similarity among uh, potassium channels and some close related uh, other channels such as voltage-gated sodium channels, uh, the, some trip channels and so on. So these would be the voltage-gated uh, channels. And, and what you can see here is, is you have potassium channels here uh, what we call two pore domain potassium channels. Uh, then you have those KV channels or voltage gated potassium channels, inward rectified potassium channels as well, and so on. And then more distantly related potassium voltage gated potassium channels where you have the calcium and the sodium uh, channels. And finally, uh, some of the trip channels as well. Uh, so this large class of, of ion channels that we call voltage-gated, uh, they will be more closely related to each other than some other ion channels that you're going to see along the course that are called uh, chemical or ligand-gated ion channels and some other ch channels that are pressure-activated or mechanically-activated ion channels. So if you look not just the sequence of amino acids, but also if you look how these amino acids interact each other locally, for example, via hydrogen bonds and so on, uh, you can predict the secondary structure of ion channels. So the secondary structure of ion channels will be local structures that you can predict based on, on the amino acid sequence. So for example, that cluster of hydrophobic amino acids that we talked before, uh, in many cases it predicts what a configuration of polypeptide called alpha helix. So, so a membrane span domain usually is an alpha helix. And alpha helix uh, you, you can find in many uh, proteins. And in you know, some other proteins also you find other secondary structures such as beta sheets. sheets. But what you really find in, in, in voltage-gated ion channels in particular are this concentration of alpha helical domains that, uh, that usually spans uh, the, the, the lipid bilayer. And, and this alpha helical domains form the transmembrane domains of ion channels. So if you look at the secondary structures of these ion channels, you can find that they have similarities within a, 
a particular subfamily. So a voltage gated potassium channel show here in the top of this figure here. Uh, you can see that they have this uh, transmembrane domains. And uh, some other types of ion channels, such as the cyclonucleotide gate channels, they look kind of similar. The inward rectified potassium channels on the other hand, you can see it has a much more simpler structures as we're going to see in another part of our course. And uh, some other class of potassium channels also have very characteristic uh, structures in terms of secondary structure. Finally, when we talk about tertiary and quaternary structures of ion channels, we talk about the three-dimensional structure of these ion channels. The tertiary structure would define not just uh, alpha helical domains or beta sheet domains of, of these channels, but also would, would define those three-dimensional structures that uh, are, are not as characteristic as alpha helical domains, for example. Uh, quaternary structures uh, relates to uh, the interactions of multiple polypeptides and that's something that you're going to uh, see along uh, this class of, of ion channels because many of those ion channels have a, a, what we call alpha, alpha subunit, the main subunit of these ion channels that contains uh, usually the pore domain of these ion channels and, and in many cases also the voltage sensing domain of these ion channels, but also you find um, interacting with these polypeptides, the alpha polypeptides, beta subunits, and sometimes gamma subunits, and some other subunits, and these interactions between the alpha, beta, gamma subunits in many cases form this complex structure, quaternary structures that we call the ion channels. Um, this beta subunits, gamma subunits in many cases, uh, in many cases we call these auxiliary proteins as well. During the past few years, there has been quite a lot of change in terms of how we view the ion channel structure. In the beginning, uh, most of the inference about the ion channel structure came from very clever, although limited information that came from that physiology. So some, some of the views of about how the ion channels look like on, on that time was something like this, in which you have a, 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 a pore domain and you would have a gating and mechanism for these ion channels and uh, would have some, some type of gating as well that would allow these ion channels to, to perform uh, their functions. Quite a lot of change uh, came when we, we start to clone uh, these ion channels. And, and by deducing uh, the molecular structure of these ion channels from these clones or from these genes, we start to learn a little bit more about how these giant channels would be formed and also some of the main domains of the ion channels involved in different function for the ion channels. So some of the cartoons that you see these days came from this time when we start to, to draw ion channels not only in terms of, uh, of a poor domain but also in terms of, of possible transmembrane domains, uh, C -termin uh, amino and C terminal uh, domains and so on. And finally, uh, quite uh, unexpectedly, uh, people have been able to crystallize uh, the proteins that form these ion channels. And that has been a, a big uh, advancement in how we understand these ion channels because now we, we start to see these ion channels with, with uh, atomic resolution in about two or three angstroms of resolution, we can start to see individual amino acids, how the side chains of the amino acids are pointed and, and, and so on. So now we have a really high resolution understanding of how some of the ion channels uh, work. 
So let's start our, our discussion here in terms of gating. Uh, as you know by now, uh, gating refers to this uh, conformational trans uh, states, uh, or gating refers to this transition between these different conformational states of these ion channels. So we start to think about ion channels not being these very static uh, proteins, but very dynamic structures that start to change conformation in response to changes in transmembrane voltage. So, an example of, of this gating uh, mechanism of, of voltage gated ion channels is shown in this figure. And, and so, in this figure, it's shown uh, two classes of ion channels that has been already been discussed in this course the delivery rate five potassium channels and, and the voltage gated sodium channels. Uh, so, let's suppose that a cell is depolarized from, let's say, minus 60 millivolts to zero millivolts, uh, what you can see that those delivery five potassium channels, the open probability of these delivery five potassium channels increase when the cell is depolarized, although this increase in open probability uh, develops in a somewhat slow fashion. And uh, then this channel stays open as long as the cell is depolarized. While the sodium channels, on the other hand, has a, a, a different kind of behavior. The cells open or very quickly, so the open probability develops or increases very quickly. And then you can start to see that with time, the open probability starts to decline even if the cell is depolarized. So we, we could draw a, a state diagram for these potassium channels. Uh, like a very simple state diagram with a closed state when the cell is hyperpolarized and then this channel will transition to an open state when the cell is depolarized and when the cell again comes back to the rest main potential this channel will transition back to the closed state. So this kind of uh, the gating mechanism of these different conformational states from closed into open could explain this kind of kinetic behavior for this class of potassium channels. While for sodium channels, uh, you have to uh, propose uh, uh, additional states to explain this kind of behavior. So not only these channels have to have a closed to open state, but finally also an inactive state in which the open probability of these channels decrease with time, even when the cell is depolarized. And then the return of this channel to the closed state when the cell hyperpolarizes. So, so let's start a discussion here again with inactivation. So the inactivation and this process in which the channels go to this non-conducting state even when the cell is depolarized. So for the lyric 5, you, uh, our discussion was saying there was very little inactivation when the cell is depolarized. Now, uh, for sodium channels, and also in this case for some potassium channels, when the cell uh, remains depolarized, this channel shows this inactivation process. In this case, we call this fast inactivation because it occurs in a time scale of few milliseconds to, let's say, at most 100 milliseconds. And uh, the class of uh, potassium channels that display this type of inactivation is called A-type potassium channels. So what could explain this fast inactivation process in these uh, voltage gated ion channels? So uh, voltage gated sodium channels and also these A-type potassium channels. Well, the classical experiment that, that, that gave some clues about what's underlying this inactivation process was performed in, in squid giant axon. And uh, these investigators 
what they did was to take squid giant axon, perform a voltage current experiment on the squid giant axon, isolate the sodium currents, and then finally what they did was uh, make a very clever experiment where they perfuse inside of this uh, giant axons this enzyme called pronase. This enzyme pronase is, is somewhat uh, a dirty enzyme that, that cleaves any kind of protein. And, and what they saw was that that behavior of, of the sodium channels, it changes uh, when they record these voltage gated sodium channels before pronase treatment and then after pronase treatment. What you can see before pronase treatment, these channels uh, show very characteristic those inward currents, okay, that inactivate of time. Uh, and uh, after pronase treatment, what they saw was that the fast inactivation was almost completely gone. Also, these, these investigators saw that in terms of activation, so this part of the curve, there was not much change before and after pronase treatment. So somehow, this treatment of the intracellular domains of these voltage-gated sodium channels in the squid giant axon was able to remove very selectively the fast inactivation process of these channels. Um, so they propose a, a very interesting mechanism, what they call ball and chain mechanism. Uh, what this investigator envisioned was that these channels would have three states, closed, open, and inactive state. In the closed state, uh, the activation gate is closed, uh, so the ions cannot go through. And then when the cell is depolarized, this activation states uh, activation gate opens and now the sodium ions can, fl uh, can flux through the ion channel so in this open state uh, but with time uh, there is this part of the ion channel that they call ball domain that would be able to swing to and block from the inside of the channel uh, the permeation pathway of these channels and, and this would account what we call the inactivation process. So uh, when the squid giant axon, uh, the intracellular uh, part of this axon was exposed to pronase, what you expect is to remove this process by pronase and therefore these channels would not have any more this inactivate state. So it would be only closed or open state, and that could account for the experimental results. This inactivation process is very important uh, to confer functional diversity among different types of channels. So for example, you can see these uh, potassium channels encoded by uh, several types of KV genes in Drosophila. Uh, you can see some potassium channels called shakers show uh, a very fast inactivation process. Some other ch ch channels called Shao shows also inactivation process that's relatively fast, but not as fast as in shaker channels. Uh, while some other ch uh, channels called Shab or, or even Shao also shows very small amount of, of fast inactivation. And uh, as we said before, uh, uh, th these potassium channels in Drosophila have been cloned and now uh, also we will be able to clone all the homologs of these potassium channels in mammalian species. But let's talk about uh, the shaker potassium channels. So uh, if you look at the amino acid sequence of the shaker potassium channels, you can see there are two major domains here, the amino terminals and the C terminals, and those two major domains uh, could account for the ball and chain mechanism for inactivation of these potassium channels. So the model for the Bain chain mechanism of any type in, uh, that also we call N-type for the fast inactivation. Uh, 
we're going to discuss in class why we call it n-type uh, is, is, is the following is, is that these potassium channels would be formed by different sub, four subunits each subunit would have one ball and one chain and when the channels glow from close to open one of this ball and chain will be able to occlude the, the permeation pathway of these channels and therefore inactivate these channels There are some experimental evidence that supports this hypothesis. So, uh, uh, so some investigators, in, in this case Hoshi et al., 1990, uh, they did the similar experiment that was performed in squid giant axon, but in this case they used trypsin, which is a more selective uh, uh, protease, and they exposed uh, inside out patches expressing shaker potassium channels. Uh, to trypsin and what you can see that going from control conditions these channels uh, if you look the single channel records of these channels if the cell is depolarized from negative to plus 20 millivolts most of these channels go from from closed state to open state and then they go to this non-conducting state very quickly that's because these channels have this fast inactivation process now if these channels are exposed, the inside out patch are exposed to trypsin, so the intracellular domain of these channels are exposed to trypsin, you can see now this channel stays open for a long period of time because the fashion activation of potassium channels is removed. Um, and finally, these investigators went after which domains of these channels are responsible for this inactivation process. So what they did was to make deletion mutants. So what they did was to remove specific amino acids of these channels and then express these channels in, in a, uh, what we call heterologous system, which is a, a means that is, is an expression system of, to express these channels in a cell that does not naturally express these channels. Uh, so what you can see is that for this mute, uh, for the wild type shaker, there is fast inactivation happening, and then when they remove amino acid six to forty six, so shaker delta six to forty six, uh, these channels behave as if these channels had been exposed to intracellular trypsin. So they remove the fast inactivation process. So, one question here is using molecular biology to test uh, Clay Armstrong, which was the investigator that first did those experiments in squid giant axon. Uh, so, we, we talk about what was performed for shaker potassium channels to test the ball and chain mechanism for channel inactivation. Now, I would like to discuss what some of the potential pitfalls of that experiment. And I would like to discuss some of the potential alternative experiments to address such criticisms. And finally, uh, what we talked very briefly was that shake potassium channels is formed from four identical subunits. Then, uh, what would be the effects of rates of inactivation if, uh, if we clip just one bowing chain or two bowing chain, three or four bowing chain? 